very good evening ladies and gentlemen everyone who's joined us from various parts of the globe my name is ruben lobo and i warmly invite you to the last session of the eighth day from the biggest virtual implantology event of 2020 ladies and gentlemen i hope all these sessions were fun and thrilling and a learning experience ladies and gentlemen i'm now inviting you to a very special session wherein we have mr richard donaka the CEO of Argen Medical Productions, Germany, the manufacturers of the world famous K3 Pro implant systems. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting to you, Dr. Richard, Mr. Richard Donaka, live. Yes, good evening. Welcome, everyone. And thank you for the invitation and my ability to present my topic to, for today, which is uh, implant connections. Hang on just a minute here. So, Ruben, are we okay? Yes, sir. Okay. So, yes, I'm the, uh, Richard Donica is my name. I'm the CEO and product development uh, engineer for the Argonne uh, company. We are a manufacturer of, hang on a minute. We are a manufacturer of uh, allograft uh, and dental implants, oral implants. We've been in the business, uh, been developing product for about 25 years. And uh, let's say have gone through um, yeah, many eras of implantology and uh, have developed the product line K3 Pro and K4 Pro, which is a new product line coming up in the fall. And over the last uh, 25 years, the products have, of course, uh, generally developed in its outer form, in thread design, in surface area, but the connection has always stayed the same. That's our topic for today is, of course, the connection of dental implants. Some people sometimes ask how I came about engineering the product. Um, I uh, was working for American implant companies many, many years ago. Um, I kind of take the, uh, the saying from, from Porsche is I was looking around for the ideal implant. I wasn't able to find this. So I decided to take the best of all worlds or from many implant companies and combine it into my own implant system, which then was developed in the late 90s. What we're going to talk about today is which screw is the right screw or which implant is the correct implant, implant designs, materials of implants, connections of implants, the conical Morse taper, platform switching, micro move it, movement on implants, bacterial seal or micro gap, the load dispersion, connection loads, abrasion factor, subcrystal insertion or equicrystal insertion, beveled shoulder, sizes, widths and lengths of implant, thread design and surface treatments. Which screw is the right one? Where are the needs placed upon the implant? We need stable tissue. We need implant to bone distance. We need subcrustal placement. And we need mirror image prosthetics. The clinical goal of our implant is of course the function, the aesthetics, through hard and soft tissue retention for lifetime implant and tissue stability. And you can see here on the graph, what we want to do is uphold the bone levels around the implant shoulder. We want to have soft tissue and hard tissue retention around the implant and not have a decrease or a drop in tissue around the implant. We also have many problems in implant, uh, let's say tissue and heart tissue support. So that we also want to keep the implant distances around the implant 
top levels or at the extrusion levels of the implant. So as you can see here that we place the implants subcrestally. The ideal implant placement is a subcrestal implant. You can place the implant one millimeter, two millimeters, and the deeper you can set the implant, the more, of course, bone retention and the more seal you will have around the bone and the soft tissue area. Whereas many implants that are set at the crestal level of the bone, of course, have a very short distance from the implant to the outer bone of the cortical plate, as well as some other implants also. A general, I think, uh, consensus or a general rule now is, uh, let's say, trying to stabilize the tissue, uh, having like a three millimeter rule to have at least three millimeters between the top of the implant and the gingival levels. Um, more, of course, is better. And if you take here the, let's say, the crestal seating of an implant, then you really only, at today's, let's say, knowledge, have one possibility, and that is setting the implant at the crestal level and having three millimeters of tissue. This will work because then you have the tissue as a seal around the connection of implant and abutment. Two millimeters doesn't work, three millimeters, uh, one millimeter doesn't work either. If you set the implant one millimeter subcrestally, then you have two possibilities with two millimeters gingival height and three millimeters. And if you are able to place the implant two millimeters subcrestally, then of course you can work with one millimeter of gingiva as well as two and three millimeters. So I think this is a general consensus and everyone is trying to uphold this kind of a three millimeter rule at the moment. What we call mirror image prosthetics is where according to the gingival height that we come out of the bone level, if we are extruding here two millimeters at the bone level, then with one millimeter of gingiva, we need to have the cover screw as well as the gingiva former, as well as the impression post, as well as the abutments, all having the same profile. And you can see here, this is kind of the theory behind mirror image prosthetics, is to have the extrusion and the emergency profile all in the same contour. So if you have a one millimeter extrusion, then you need to have a one millimeter contour. Two millimeters, two millimeter contour. Three millimeters, three millimeter contour. This is the theory to have, let's say, all the components giving you the exact same emergency profile. Implant designs. Uh, today's world is very confusing. We have, I don't know, 600, 700 implant companies worldwide, everyone offering many implant types. So which implant design is for what bone, is for what tooth as a replacement. Uh, very few implant companies have a complete line and are able to, let's say, uh, supply a complete line which, uh, let's say, covers all aspects of implantology. But I think more and more companies are trying to uh, strive to reach that goal. Materials. We have, of course, our material which is biologically and uh, let's say tested over the last let's say 40 years which is titanium uh, we make our implants ourselves out of a grade four uh, there are companies on the market that make a grade five implant which is uh, let's say uh, an aluminum alloy um, it's not the ideal implant but many companies need to strengthen or harden the material that they use to, um, let's say, keep from having breakages around the implant shoulder. Uh, we use a grade four because we have very good load dispersion down through the implant. Uh, there's new materials on the market now, zirconium materials, which we are also bringing out in the, uh, in the latter part of this year. Um, I think it's kind of a trend. Zirconium is not the ideal uh, material for implants, 
but it is, let's say, a non-metal type implant, at least in the, in the thinking of the consumer. And uh, this is kind of a new trend to go to zirconium oxide materials. We also have um, other materials, other um, marketing things uh, for surface treatments, for um, uh, implant materials, which are on the market now with some uh, marketing names. Um, I think in basis, everyone is understanding that the uh, titanium is the most biocompatible material at the moment. Forms, you can see, of course, many, many forms in implantology today. Um, forms are kind of uh, supplying different threads, supplying different, let's say, uh, designs of the implant. Um, matching the teeth or not matching the teeth. They're all basically screws. Everyone has some kind of a marketing um, ability or possibility to uh, make their implant with the design of the thread and the implant, let's say, uh, more compatible to, let's say, the natural tooth area than others. I kind of think it's a little bit more marketing than it is, uh, let's say, uh, study or a, a basis of scientific basis there. Differences, of course, in many um, companies are the outer design of the implant. Um, many companies try to develop some kind of a marketing outer design to make the implant a little bit more attractive. Um, but we do have also uh, system weaknesses. Probably in all systems, there are weaknesses. Uh, in, in, in turn, um, implant companies have um, restricted their development to outer developments and not inner developments. And so you have implant companies that have different types of implants, but basically they all have developed their uh, implant connection over the last, let's say, 30 or 40 years and have tried to stay with these connections if possible. You can also see here that on certain implant systems like uh, here on, the, uh, on this implant that they have two types of implants, both types of implants have, let's say, a problem on the connection side to avoid, let's say, bacterial influence, so that if you would remove the abutment, you do have a smell, there is bacterial influence, which of course causes for, um, let's say, um, peri-implant problems in the hard and soft tissue area. These are the implants, one at a tissue level, one at a bone level. Both implants are, say, comparable. Both implants are from the same implant company, but both implants have a problem in that they do not protect the implant abutment connection to avoid bone loss. Whereas you can see here, there is a uh, conical connection from another manufacturer which upholds then also the bone retention and soft tissue retention. The literature in general states, we have a peri-implant bone loss after one year of about 1.6 millimeters. I think this is also a general consensus. There's enough literature out there. So um, I think the biggest problem is that we have with implants is not, do they heal? Do, are they not uh, clean? Uh, the biggest problem we have with implants is how do we retain the soft and hard tissue area around the implant. There are implants with a conical connection that do uphold the bone levels. Uh, we're not the only manufacturer on the market that does this. Uh, we also for over about 25 years ago decided to go with you know, a Morse taper a conical connection. And we do have a bacterial sealed and a system that uh, will uphold the tissue area of hard and soft bone. 
Um, the hardest thing to change for a manufacturer is the connection. Once you've started with the connection, it's, it's very, very difficult to change because then you change the whole system. You have all the new parts. Uh, they don't match. They don't, uh, are, are not compatible. So manufacturers are kind of stuck on what they have and they don't change a running system. We were fortunate, of course, to have the connection that we have stayed with also over the last 25 years. So I think if we look at implant connections in general, you can see that there's many, many types of connections out there. The manufacturer has, uh, for whatever reason, decided on a certain connection. But I think everyone is uh, also in the understanding that a conical connection is a better connection than, let's say, a butt joint or another type of connection. Five basic types of implant connections that we have today on the market that are, let's say, manufacturing and having some, uh, some product influence. That's the flat connection, the tube and tube connection, the butt joint type connection, a tapered platform switch connection, and the actual conical connection. There are, of course, abilities and things that one can do with a non, let's say, um, conical connection. You can, of course, design uh, platform switching. You can try to reduce the micro gap by producing the, the uh, connection a little bit in a tighter tolerance. Uh, you can make the connections in or under gingival levels, or you can make the connection in the gingival its level itself. Uh, if you look at the cross-section of different implant companies, you will always see some type of a gap. Uh, there is, let's say, in all connections, except for a Morse taper conical, good conical connection, you will see some type of a gap or bacterial influence in the implant. Also in a parallel, parallel wall connection, there is kind of the rocking uh, effect of the implant uh, connection to the abutment. So there's no real advantage to use that without a conical connection in a platform switch. You can see that many, many connections today in a cross section have quite a bit of play and quite a bit of tolerance so that you can imagine over time that in the patient's mouth, these connections will get wider and wider and cause more and more, let's say, bacterial influence and problems. We have uh, quite a variation of, let's say, also anti-rotation or connections in general on the market, uh, all of which, except for conical connections, do not have a press fit or a, let's say, it's a technology that actually allows for a bacterial seal. The conical taper is what we're going to, let's say, promote here today in the general connections. The conical taper is, um, of course, everyone on the market is saying that they have a conical connection. Um, we go with a Morse taper connection, which is under six degrees. This is a, a conical connection that is um, more like a cold welding. It's, uh, it's a press fit connection. It's not in engineering terms really cold welding, but it is a connection that once you have um, either tapped or screwed the connection together, the connection can only be released with a special tool. So you have a very tight seal of the connection, whereas wider taper conical connections really are, let's say, saying it's conical, but still have the problem that they also have tolerances and let's say not quite the bacterial seal. Once you release the screw on a wider connection, then you can release or remove the abutment without any problems. The six degree taper, which we have, or less than six degree taper, cause for the, um, the tight connection of the implant and the abutment, and you really have, after that, a one-piece implant. 
the mechanics of the um, taper is actually that, let's say anything that is uh, over 10 to 15 degree is a weak conical connection. The six degree is a tight fit, but is easily disconnected. That's six degrees on each side, so 12 degrees in total. And a three degree connection, so let's say 1.5 or three degrees on each side is a sealed connection and no disconnection without, let's say, a special tool that helps you to remove or release the abutment and implant connection. The industrial usage is, of course, widespread. Uh, uh, in, in industrial use, the Morse taper is, uh, is used in, in uh, of course, uh, automotive industry. It's used in the, uh, in the air industry, um, connecting parts with a conical connection to make sure they have a perfect fit and do not have the problem of, let's say, um, uh, loosening or problems of uh, connections. So the Morse tapered conical connection is a stable connection. It's uh, anti-rotational stability. So we actually don't need a, a hexagon or some type of a anti-rotation system. It is placeable 360 degrees. Uh, it doesn't need anti-rotation hexagon or anything else. It has no micro movements, no micro gap, and the load is not placed onto the connection screw. So once you remove the screw, uh, which uh, places the abutment, it doesn't put any load on the screw. You can see a cut view here of the connection. So the connection is a very, very stable connection. It's like a one piece implant um, and uh, allows basically for, um, um, allows for actually um, uh, load dispersion down through the implant to avoid, of course, any uh, breakage of, of screw or implant. Here you can see again, it's, it's kind of a press fit. It's not a cold welding, but it does, let's say, push the parts together. The material, the titanium material, the grade four is somewhat soft so that these two kind of melt together and make for, let's say, a one-piece unit. Also, what we have, of course, is the uh, load dispersion, um, which I mentioned before. Once you have these parts put together, the loads are dispersed down through the implant. It's a long connection. It's actually the longest connection on the market uh, so that we are dispersing and we actually also have <clears throat> even three millimeter implants uh, in diameter, which take for very, very strong loads. I think there's uh, very few implant companies on the market that can really say that they have a three millimeter diameter implant that would take very strong loads. So why the K3 Pro? It's a very stable connection with a conical taper of three degrees total. The differences in conical connection is also that the 1.5 degree conical connection has for the seating of the abutment has a screw. The screw though is only used to seat the implant at the zero level in the implant and the screw actually does not take any loads or the function uh, away. So uh, if you put the screw in with 15 Newton centimeters, uh, you have basically a one piece implant that will disperse the loads down through the implant and act like a one piece implant. I think there's no connection that's stronger on the market, uh, load dispersion through a more taper connection. Platform switching, which is uh, something, of course, the companies uh, try to help the implant connections that they have. The platform switching is basically taking the abutment and making it smaller than the implant. So it's a reduction of the implant of the abutment diameter, which 
basically on non-platform switching implants is the epithelial wandering along the implant surface is a problem. The biological width is directed vertically instead of horizontally. And horizontal bone loss is also prominent on non-platform switching implants. On platform switching conical connected implants, you have a guiding through the epithelial and taking away from the peri-implant bone through horizontal shift of the connection, a better retention of the crustal bone level, an optimal barrier function through the stable soft tissue cuff, smaller diameter abutment withholds more space for the peri-implant soft tissue, and an optimal soft tissue stabilization through the combination of micro-movement free and bacterial sealed implant connection, more or less the platform switch. There's been studies done, of course, on the platform switching and on the, let's say, conical connection. Yes, on even a wide conical connection, if you reduce the diameter of the abutment, it will reduce your bone loss levels, but it still does not solve the problem in total. Micro movement on implants, there's been uh, of course, uh, several studies done, which has become it's kind of the, the world uh, basis for uh, conical connection is the University of Frankfurt, which did uh, dynamic load tests on, uh, on implant and abutment connections to see what kind of micro movement, what kind of uh, micro gaps um, the implants have. You can see here that on conical connections, um, there are, let's say, um, a one-piece implant type connection also gives for a solid connection and does not have any breakage through the connection as long as it's, it's a long con conical connection. Many reasons for implant breakages, uh, screw breakages, if, is of course the mismatching of of implant and abutment uh, pieces. You, uh, the incongruity is what we call the uh, tolerances that you have to have when you don't have a, a press fit connection. You have to have some tolerances and some play that the parts even will fit together. So uh, most of the reason here is that you have a, depending on of course the manufacturing process and what type of a, let's say, mass product the, the implant is, the more play you have, the more reasons you will have for, for fractures of implants, abutments, and screws. You can see here that with the load forces that automatically then in a lateral force, you can see here that you know, you start, the more forces you put on, the wider the connection that the implant and abutment connection is going to get, especially on flat connections. The bacterial seal is something, or the micro gap, is also what they looked at. Averaging load was about a thousand cycles and taking the uh, main manufacturers, you can see the main problem was screw fractures abutment fractures was also a problem and even some implant fractures were also taking place. The influence of the micro gap was done also in a study, the comparison of bone loss through abutment connections with micro gap. So what they did is in the, um, in the study, they actually welded the implant and abutment together in, at different heights and it was actually found that the bone loss is significantly influenced by the micro movements, but not through the size of the micro gap. So the, the larger the gap wasn't such an influence as the micro movements themselves. So that they found out that flat implant and abutment connections with micro movements will definitely lead to bone loss. You can see here on the cut view that the micro gap and especially under load possibilities that you have more and more, let's say, implants with a gap or a micro pump effect where you have bacteria going into the implant and 
pumping bacteria in and out, which will of course cause for bone and soft tissue then loss. I've got a lot of hanging here. Can you still hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, my presentation has stopped here. Hang out just a minute. I might have to start again. Yeah, probably you could uh, stop your screen share and reshare it. Hang on just a quick second. I'm hanging on this one slide. Yeah, uh, Ruben, I've got a glitch here. Hang on a minute. No, it's still stuck. Yeah, it's stuck on this one slide here. Yeah, uh, what you do is uh, probably stop your screen share and reshare the whole presentation once again. I can start there where I left off. Let me see. I can't get out of this though. Should I, should I do it for you? Can you, you can hear me, but you can't see me moving correctly. That's right, sir. I can't see uh, your presentation moving. Yeah, so my... It's stuck on the slide which says straw man tissue level. Yeah, right, and that's my whole presentation. So now I need to... Okay, let me see what's going on here. I might have to start again and, and join again. Hang on just a minute. No, you don't have to join again, sir. You just have to stop your screen share and reshare the screen. Yeah, but I can't even move my mouse at the moment. Here we go. Okay, now we're going. There it is. Uh, okay, now it went back. Okay, now we are out of the presentation. You have to reshare your screen. Okay, now we're back. Okay, Raman. Share screen, the same option. Yeah, I'm doing it. Hang on just a minute. Are we on? Yeah, we're on. We're on Bego. Okay, all right. Back online with my, seems it's my computer. So, yeah, we have, of course, uh, even implant uh, companies on the market that have a, a taper connection, have a wide taper, but still have a problem that the connection is not a bacterial sealed connection. So the more forces, the more load that is put on, the more the gap, the micro gap, the more, let's say, micro movement you have in the implant, uh, you can see here on the conical connection on the K3 that there's no movement, there's no gap. It's like a one-piece implant, so it has a complete bacterial seal. It's kind of the rubber boot effect, what we call. It's a pump effect through micro-movements 
that are constantly flushing bacterial oxides, toxides through the micro gap and causing the peri-implant bone loss. This permanent during the micro movements and of course over time will produce more and more bone loss and of course tissue then falling behind it. So you can see here the more bacterial influence that you have, the more the gap widens, the more bacteria is in and out flushed and the more the actual bone loss will be promoted. In the end over a few years period, the more and more recession of the bone and tissue levels around the implant. A strong implant. We, in a long conical connection, you have very, very good dispersion. And you can see here on the slides that there is in it's kind of the red area is where there's strong loads being produced. And you can see here on the connection that around the implant and abutment connection, there is no red and no actual loads being promoted on the connection itself. So even like on our small implant diameters, we don't have, let's say the, the problem of screw or implant breakages. So the longer the connection is, the more the ability would be to, let's say, uphold the, uh, the, uh, uh, the bone and tissue levels and, of course, reduce breakages. Connection loads, it's in general, of course, when you have not a long connection but have shorter connections, then the problem is in screw or implant breakages. So if if a company is promoting a conical connection, then this conical connection should be a long conical connection and not a short conical connection, which is, let's say, um, causing loads on the implant shoulder or the screw or the abutment to implant connection. So a reason for breakages during loads is usually the micro gap, the micro movement, the more play you have, the more strain you're going to put on the connection, uh, the load, of course, on the connection screw, and the incongruity of the components is some uh, major reasons for breakages during loading. Oops, sorry, I was going back. Here we can see um, we have, of course, our own laboratory. We test many implants on the market, and we also have seen that on, on implant and abutment connections, not only do you have breakages, but you also have uh, titanium particles that are prominent through the abrasion of the incongruent parts, which are an additive factor to peri-implant bone loss. Um, these also might be a possibility of titanium allergies they do go into the bloodstream, the soft tissue area, and through tests, you can see that even taking breakages, but that also the abrasion factor causes titanium particles to develop through the abrasion of the two parts, the abutment and the implant. And you can see here that after lifetime use that there are a lot of titanium particles that have developed and you can see here this was after five million cycles of an implant connection uh, i mean this is quite a bit of titanium that has uh, developed here as titanium particles through the abrasion factor and these of course are in going into the bloodstream these are swallowed by the patient or or uh, also going into the outlying uh, soft tissue uh, areas. Subcrustal insertion is of course something that the implant should be able to do because 
um, if the if the literature is saying 1.6 millimeters of bone loss, then of course uh, you would want to have either an implant that will uphold the bone, and this is subcrustal insertion, or otherwise your implant is going to be, let's say a 10 millimeter implant is really going to only be in the end to eight millimeters of bone retention. There's also some advantages, of course, to subcrustal implant placement in that you can do augmentations. Uh, it's very easy to uh, work with uh, smaller implants. You have more bone support. So uh, it's very good possibility of also taking subcrustal implants and doing bone augmentations in one seating. Same here, also bone grafts are also easier with smaller implants that take strong loads because you can also do a simultaneous bone graft and implant placement. The beveled shoulder is something also to look at. Uh, the beveled shoulder causes um, the possibility of getting a bone collar around the implant shoulder. So when you're seating the implant at subcrustal levels, if you have a beveled shoulder, this also then produces, uh, let's say, additive uh, bone retention. What bone doesn't like is, of course, 90 degree angles uh, and sharp angles in general, so that a good beveled shoulder will also uphold your bone and tissue levels. The emergency profile, of course, for uh, many implants that have a direct abutment and implant connection is a very broad emergency profile. It has a disadvantage, it's less, less flexible, whereas a small um, emergency profile with a conical connection allows you to actually uh, promote your own design of emergency profiles. It's also very easy for the technician also to do his designs. Sizes, widths, and lengths of implants today. Uh, I think uh, companies should have many uh, possibilities of implant designs, also thread designs. We have what we call the Sure implant design, which is a compression thread implant design, basically used in hard bone areas. We have a self-tapping implant, which is called the Rapid implant. Um, it's more an aggressive implant for uh, implant directional uh, implantation. Uh, we have uh, what we call a one core implant, which is good for extractions and immediate placements. It's a one core, one body, and extending then the implant um, thread or uh, flare. Um, we have the short implants. We start at 5.5 and go up to 7.5 is what we call short implants. We have diameter reduced implants. We have three millimeter implants and go all the way up to eight millimeter implants. Um, and of course, all implants have the same connection. All have the same Morse taper connection and all take the same prosthetic parts. So it's very, very easy to use uh, for as an implant system. Thread design is also something that we incorporate um, through many studies that have been done. Um, there are thread designs that promote, you know, immediate loading. There are thread designs that uh, promote uh, a good uh, osseo integration or beginning osseo integration in the first couple of months. Uh, some are better in in four month period. Our thread designs are in general so that we actually try to promote a a good primary stability in a very short period of time and a strong, let's say, osseo integration for long-term loading. Surfaces and treatment is my last topic here, kind of. It's uh, surface treatments are, yeah, uh, in, in general, I would take for granted that all implants have a surface treatment that is working. You know, everyone is saying they have 98% uh, success rate. Our surface treatment is, um, uh, somewhat special in that we use acid uh, treatment only. What we try to do here is not only have a very homogeneous surface, but we try to get undercuts so that we have a tunneling effect and we have a 
let's say, fast osseo integration time or an immediate loading possibilities of the implants. So which screw is the right one? What do we need for a good implant? In closing, it's implants for subcrestal insertion. We need a stable connection to the implant. We need a bacterial seal. We try to prevent micro movement or micro gap, platform switching, load dispersion, abrasion free, beveled shoulder, anatomical implant and thread designs and an active surface treatment. The K3 Plo implant is something I think you should look at which actually has, through the Morse taper connection, all the advantages of a good conical connection. Um, if you look also at some studies that a good conical connection has a very, very high success rate and a very low bone loss possibilities. Uh, the company Argon is an implant engineering and development company. We do not promote mass production of products. Um, we are a family run business and we're not here to be the biggest, but we are here to be the best in the market. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen in to the lecture. I would be happy to answer any questions that you have and I hope to meet you sometime in the future in the country of origin where you're watching from. All right, the first question is, can the micro gaps be overcome by placing calcium hydroxide paste on final placement of processes? Not long term, no. I think there's a lot of possibilities of putting something into the implant connection to avoid bacteria. But let's say we're talking here now implants as a lifetime uh, restoration for the patient. Uh, I think uh, it's not anymore today that an implant should last 10, 15 years. And I think if uh, implants today are lasting, you know, 20, 30, even longer years, then I think uh, the connection uh, needs to be a bacterial seal connection uh, as, as a conical connection and not uh, with an additive. Thank you so much, sir. We move to the next question. If an implant which is having a 1.5 degree true most of a connection is so good, why is it that there are so many companies which are not following these protocols? It's because, like I mentioned in my lecture, is, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago when implant companies uh, started, they had to uh, start with some type of connection. And at that time, they took the connection that they thought would be best. And uh, um, I was fortunate in taking a connection that uh, is today modern. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, I was uh, going to people and they would say, you know, no one is doing conical connections, so why are you doing it? Today, everyone is saying that they have a conical connection. It might not be a good conical connection, and they might have put you know, just a small phase in there, uh, but um, I think today it's very uh, understandable that an implant company, a worldwide implant company, cannot just say, okay, what we did you know, 20, 30 years ago is not the standard today and we're going to change the implant system in total. So this is why they take other avenues and take, you know, and do different surface treatments. They try to change the outside of the implant, but it's very, very hard to change the internal connection or the connection of the implant and abutment once you have started back 20 or 30 years ago. All right, we move to the next question. What, according to you, is the best book for clinical implantology, especially understanding the conical connections? What is the best? I didn't understand the question again, sorry. Yeah, what is the be best book, according to you, for clinical implantology, especially the conical connection? Um, I mean, I must have to say the best book probably on conical connections, uh, uh, there is no real book on conical connections. Of course, a uh, uh, company like Bicon is also a, a conical connection that has been, I think, uh, uh, 30 or 40 years on the market with a 1.5 degree taper. Uh, there are other companies also doing 1.5 degree taper connections now. 
uh, smaller companies on the market. Um, uh, a book, of course, uh, uh, Zero Bone Loss, the Quintius uh, and uh, Micelli, uh, they all promote, of course, that you can do more with a conical connection than you can with a, a flat connection. So there are books out there. There is nothing specific to conical connections because 95% uh, of the market is uh, not good conical connections, but uh, that's why probably there's not enough literature out there to promote that. All right, so we move to the next question. I have been using K3 Pro implants, but I'm very fascinated about the implant system. I would want to know more about the K4 implant system that you've mentioned. Where can I know more about the same? I'm sorry, Ruben, you were, it's echoing, echoing a little bit. I wasn't able to understand that. Can you give that again? Once again, so sorry. Uh, I have been using the K3 Pro implant system and I must say it's a fantastic and a fabulous implant system. I would like to know more about the K4 implant system that you have mentioned earlier at the start of your presentation. Where can I get to know more about the same? I don't know what country you're in, but of course uh, we will be coming out now in the fall in September with uh, the K4 system. Uh, it'll be completely available starting of course in January of 2021. Uh, our distribution partners or our um, partners in general will be starting to promote the system sometime in the fall. Uh, you can of course get literature and information directly from us here in Germany. Um, write me an email, send me a notice and I'll get you the information or I'll ask my distributor to get in contact. Thank you so much sir. Uh, a slightly deviating question. Uh, why is it named as Argen? Uh, argon is um, actually, it, it's, argon is a gas, it's um, a special gas. We consider ourselves, ourselves a, a, a special system. We're not, you know, an, an ordinary gas, we're not an ordinary system. Um, argon is a name that I thought was, uh, fits our company. I um, also, um, have a, um, a tendency to take something that is uh, um, initially with an A letter so that uh, when we're visiting exhibitions, of course, um, you're not last in line when, when you're, uh, you're uh, put in some type of an index um, rating. And uh, so, but Argon, I think uh, the name came about because of the, uh, the, uh, the speciality as a gas and that's why I took that name. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. What is the failure rate of an implant with a conical connection? I don't think one can say, you know, it's in general, which conical connection and was the implant placed, uh, you know, is it a conical connection that you can place subcrestally and did you place the implant subcrestally? It's uh, kind of the topic. If you would take our implant now, and you would place it at the crestal level of the bone, then of course the implant is still going to get bacterial influence, especially if you don't have the soft tissue collar around the implant. So uh, we you know, also might have a case if, if the implant was not placed subcrestally so that you get this bone closure and bone collar around the implant and you have, let's say a thin, uh, tissue uh, type patient, then of course uh, that bacterial influence is even going to cause some peri-implant influence on our implants. So I think it's depending on the connection and how deep or how safe you put the implant subcrestally and how much, let's say, soft tissue you have to promote the, the sealing around the implant connection. Thank you so much, sir. Last question before we wind up. Nowadays, clinicians are immediately placing gingival former after implant placement in a two-state surgery. What is your opinion with respect to this? Uh, we do that in, let's say, a large number of cases. In the United States, uh, we actually, for, I would say, a good 90% of the cases, we actually do individual gingival formers for each case. Uh, in Germany here, we're about 50-50. 50 doing gingival formers in, uh, let's say, single stage surgery, 
uh, and about 50% uh, doing two-stage. But um, uh, I am a strong promoter of uh, doing an immediate gingival former, especially individual gingival formers that match actually that tooth area.